issues. Um, and I also apologize for the issue with the letter and the warning. You're not crazy. The letter said 6 p.m. The warning said 6.30. I don't know how that got changed between posting and going out in the mail, but it did, and things happen. Um, so thank you, everybody, for uh, joining this evening. Again, apologies for the tech for the folks joining online. Um, tonight is an update on the Municipal Wastewater Project. Dana, the look on your face is, is awesome. <laughs> um, the, um, I'm trying to see if that speaker, okay, that speaker is off just now. Um, so tonight is an update on the Municipal Wastewater Project for Montgomery Center and Montgomery Village. Um, I'm going to just start with some high level overview of some kind of where we're at with things. And then we have both our engineering team from Hoyle Tanner here tonight, as well as our legal team from Tarrant, the law firm that we're working with, to make sure all of this is done in a way that it works and is functional and as easy as possible for everybody in town. Um, so high level, where we're at, um, work in the center is progressing. We're in final engineering right now. Um, we expect final engineering to uh, wrap up in 2020, uh, this year, 2024, and to break ground um, next spring uh, for work in the center. Um, the system would then go operational that following season. Um, work in the village, this was in the town report, um, but we invited everybody here tonight just in case folks didn't read the town report or have questions about it. But we failed to secure the disposal site for the village system after about six months of discussion and negotiation. Um, so there is no disposal site for the village. We have not been able to secure an alternative. So at this point, the village system is indefinitely paused. Um, we, we have like one other thing that we're looking at to see if there's some potential functionality in the future we could look at with a different system design. But as, as of now, barring some miraculous thing, um, work in the village is paused indefinitely. Um, as we tee up the engineering conversation for the village, I want to just highlight that what we're, what we're building is, is truly a community system. Um, when people think of wastewater systems, they often, often think about systems that are designed for bigger municipalities, bigger cities, where the pipes come out of the front of the building, they go to the street, and there's a force main, and everything follows all the right of ways in the street, the same infrastructure layout. The system we're designing for the center is different. Um, mainly because if we were to build something that follows that kind of classic wastewater design, it would be ungodly expensive and it wouldn't really work well. Um, so what we're building is a community system, and I say that because the way that the system's gonna be laid out is gonna be different than what you think about with a traditional system. Rather than kind of this perpendicular grid, it's gonna look a lot more like a spider web. And what that means is that pieces of the infrastructure are going to be laid out in a way where there's individual infrastructure and common infrastructure, and the engineering team will get at that. But it really is defined as a community system. Um, I'll also say that what we're building here is, is relatively new to Vermont. You know, when we think about wastewater systems and communities in Vermont, they're really looking at much bigger communities. Vermont's moving to a place where they want to work with communities like Montgomery and put in systems like the community system that we're building, and they are fully supportive of it, which is a great thing. Um, Montgomery's always kind of been an outlier and kind of treaded its own path, but in what we're doing here, we're really breaking new ground in terms of building something that can be an example for the rest of the state, and I think that's kind of cool. Um, and because of that, the state has put so much support and effort and assistance behind it that um, we're, we're really teed up to be really successful here in terms of what we're building. Um, I know there's differences of opinion in the room about need and everything else, but when you look at the nuts and bolts of the support we've got, the funding we've got, we're in the best position of any community in the state right now to actually execute something like this. And regardless of everything else, I, I think that's really special and something that the town can be proud of. Um, so what we're gonna do tonight, we're gonna walk through the changes in the engineering system that we've made since the last time we all got together. We're gonna um, have a conversation about what the easements that uh, we're gonna be looking at are gonna be involved and what's gonna be required there. And we're talking about easements because this system is all gonna be town infrastructure. 
and you'll need easements to come in and do work to construct it, construct it but also to do any work in the future as far as maintenance goes. Um, when you think about the water system in town, we don't need easements for the water system because all the water system infrastructure is in the public right of way, so the town can come up and dig up a road whenever it wants to. In this case, because the infrastructure for the system is going to be outside of the right of way, we will need easements in order to access it, construct it, and maintain it. Um, we're then going to move into a question and answer session. So we're going to do question and answers in the room and online. So folks online, when we move to those, I'll unmute things so we can hear you and you can ask questions. And then I also want to just make it really clear that outside of question and answers tonight, um, we are going to have what we'll call office hours uh, coming up probably the week of March 25th. Um, and we'll get solid dates out of those out as soon as we know those. But what we're looking to do is basically set up a, a window from like 3 to 8 p.m. where any landowner on the system can come in, sit down with us, the engineering team, the legal team, and ask really individual questions. Like, I've got a, um, a rose bush that I really love and I'm curious how this might impact it, or how is this gonna run here, or any kind of individual, we wanna make this as, as easy as possible for everybody. And we want to take as much time as we need to sit down with every landowner, every user on the system, and work this out together. So um, I just want to make sure that, and we'll touch on that again, but we do want to have you know, these office hours available. So if you've got questions that aren't addressed tonight, or you think of questions later, um, we'll make time available for those individual one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to um, John Riley, who is the lead engineer from Hoyle Tanner on the project and he's gonna walk us through some slide decks about where we stand with engineering. You can hold it however you want to hold it. This is the Montgomery Center Sewer Service Area. It, it uh, mirrors the, uh, the town water system. Uh, it extends from the rec park out to the west, down into the center, uh, up onto Mountain Road, up just a little bit beyond the Furrier Farm Road. Uh, it extends out Hayes and Snotch Road to Regan Road, and it serves a couple of homes down on South Main Street. Uh, a community wastewater system uh, typically. The community wastewater system will typically uh, include uh, septic tanks located uh, on each of the individual property owners' properties, along with uh, buried effluent sewer piping uh, that conveys the effluent to pump stations, and then the pump stations pump the effluent up to uh, a new. <coughs> A water resource recovery facility up on Mountain Road uh, where there's a secondary flush treatment system that will treat the effluent and then uh, it will disperse the, uh, the treated effluent into the soil uh, through a drip dispersion system. So uh, since our last uh, progress meeting about 18 months ago there has been some project changes uh, that we've made uh, in, in part to address some of the concerns that were raised during that meeting. Uh, previously, the, uh, the proposed system included uh, what's called, what are called step tanks. So that's a septic tank effluent pump system where there's a pump in each individual septic tank. Uh, and so there would have been you know, roughly 100 pumps throughout the center uh, to convey the effluent to the water resource recovery facility. Uh, and uh, during the last 18 months, as we moved through the engineering part of the project, we found that we could uh, serve all of the properties with uh, a conventional gravity sewer, or a conventional uh, septic tank without a pump. Uh, and so to reduce the capital costs, the operation and maintenance costs, uh, as well as the replacement costs, uh, 
the project is now defined with, with conventional uh, gravity septic tanks. Uh, and that should provide continuous sewer service during, even during extended power outages. Uh, and it eliminates the need to extend power wiring from individual homes or businesses to step tanks. Uh, so that is, that is one significant change in the project. Uh, the, the town has secured significant grant funding for this project. Uh, for the center project, the estimated total project cost is just over ten, uh, just over ten point five million dollars, and uh, the town has secured just over nine point eight million dollars in grant funding. Uh, and so, uh, the, this funding program includes a clean water state revolving fund loan. Uh, in the amount of just over $700,000. And those loan terms are for 30 years at 1.13% interest rate. The, the annual debt payment on that $715,000 loan is just over $28,000. And the annual O&M costs for the, the center wastewater system is estimated at about $92,000. So that comes up to a total annual system cost of just over $120,000. Uh, the town has put in place a local options tax, and in, in recent times, uh, it's been uh, uh, producing about $80,000 annually uh, in income. And so applying that $80,000 to the total annual system cost leaves a total cost to the users of the system, so just the sewer users, of just over $40,000. And that results in an estimated annual equivalent user rate of just under $350. And that is just for Montgomery Center, yes. So we have made a lot of engineering progress since our last meeting 18 months ago. Uh, we have completed the topographic and utility field survey. Uh, we've completed the wetland delineation, and we've received the permit capacity determination from the state. And we've also completed the final engineering drawings to the 60% level. Upcoming project engineering effort includes uh, advancing the final engineering drawings from the 60% level to the 90% level. Uh, that, this uh, will also include uh, individual property owner meetings, as Charlie alluded to earlier. Uh, that will be in, in the coming weeks. Uh, we also will be performing an archaeological resource assessment uh, in May. The storm warnings are, uh, they've been staked out. You might see the weight, uh, the stakes around town with the white paint on top. Uh, that work will be completed uh, starting very soon and, and going into it April. And we will also be preparing and submitting the permit application for the project uh, in the coming uh, weeks to months. We will also be uh, moving through the easement acquisition process. Sarah will be uh, discussing that uh, in, in just a moment. And as Charlie alluded, uh, we'll, we'll be going out to bid this fall, 2024, uh, with a spring construction, 2025, and uh, this, the uh, startup uh, for the following season in 2026. And so that kind of is a wrap. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, what is presented tonight is, is the project progress to date. There may be some more project modifications as we uh, move through the remainder of the project. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to Charlie. Thanks, John. Um, and I apologize for those online. Um, the slides are really difficult to see. Um, we are going to post a recording of this uh, as quickly as possible after the meeting so folks can go back and view the slides. But Apologies that they're a little difficult to see on the Zoom. Um, so now we're going to shift and um, we're going to hear from Sarah. And Sarah is going to talk about um, the uh, easement process and what that looks like or is going to look like. Sitting in buckets. So there you go. So, can I stand in front or does uh, that matter? 
Yeah, just, uh, yeah, right, wherever you want to go. Right. <laughs> and just make sure that you hold both of those up as close as your mouth. Good evening. My name is Sarah Buxton. I'm an attorney. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm an attorney at Tarrant Villa Shems. We're a law firm in Montpelier. Um, we deal a lot with municipal law and with projects like this. Um, we're pretty, uh, sorry, getting a little feedback here. We're um, a pretty mid-sized firm, but we have lots of experience in helping, especially with new projects and kind of solution, finding solutions to, um, finding solutions to uh, some of these complicated problems. Before I go any further, I want to say one really important thing that I think you as taxpayers need to hear. Um, I work with a lot of towns, and my colleagues do as well. And I don't think, and I've said this to Charlie a few times in front of, I hope, some of the, the town staff, I don't know that you can appreciate enough how valuable your town staff have been in saving you as taxpayers money in the part of the work that I have to do, which is working in your town records, um, looking at every little document and every little uh, piece of material, and your staff have saved you tens of thousands of dollars already um, because they're keeping impeccable records and are, it, they make it so easy for me to say, I need, I need this document. And you know, you're not paying me all these billable hours to go through and uh, find things myself. You, you really have a top-notch team here, and, and you're really lucky. I, I wish every town had uh, staff like yours. <clears throat> She's talking about uh, Liz and Genevieve and Aaron, not me. I'm just paying the ass. <laughs> that's that's true. <laughs> All right. So um, my my part of this is uh, to talk a little bit about the easements. Um, so that's going to be the main focus of my work. So first, for those who aren't familiar with what the term is, um, an easement creates a non-possessory right to come onto a person's land, uh, which is in the possession of another person, and it obligates the, the possessor of the land not to interfere um, with the uses that are authorized. So a few important pieces here. Um, the possession of the land doesn't change. The possession of your land will still remain yours. There will be terms about when the town or the town's designees can come onto your land and what they can do. And to some extent, our conversations, you know, you and I and my colleagues, will be to try to address any concerns you have about what the town is asking for. So the reason why this is needed, um, so the town, as I just said, needs the legal right to come onto your land and to construct and to maintain this community wastewater system. This is um, a public good. It's something that your town has decided. Um, you've gone through a democratic process. You've authorized bonds. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, and I, I, I imagine there's been a lot of verbose debate about this. But as this pro project goes forward, um, as a public good, the, the town and the government needs to do, do the right thing and make sure that as we take these steps, um, they have the legal right to do what, um, you know, the, the town is paying engineers and construction folks to, to put together. So in general, your easement description, we're still working through some different drafts because as Charlie and John noted, this is a really different system. It's not T's. It's not coming from the right of way directly to your house and then back out to the right of way. It, the, the design of the system um, is unique. So we're still working through how that language is, is really going to look on the piece of paper. You'll see those pieces of paper individualized for your own land uh, before you're asked to sign them. Um, but generally, what it's going to have, it'll be a page or two. It'll be a description of your land. Um, it'll talk about the location and the size of the infrastructure. So for example, there will be a pipe that goes to a tank 
and perhaps a pipe that goes to another tank or across to another main line. And so that the description of where all of that equipment is underneath the ground will be in the easement and it will refer to some engineering designs that will be also on record once the, the project is complete. It'll talk about a temporary and a permanent easement. And, and so you're aware, obviously to construct something, you're gonna need a little bit more space to install the infrastructure. But then once it's covered up, the limitations that you may have on what, what can be done above the space um, are much less severe. So it may be um, the, the permanent easement, I think right now, would be three feet on either line, either side of the, the pipe, where the pipe lands on your land. So that's the, the size that we're working through. And we're talking about the details, trying to understand what science and engineering tells us um, we need to put in the legal language so as to allow you to enjoy your land um, in as much of the same way that you currently do. So we continue to ask each other questions. I say, does it need to say this? Do we have to put this in here? And we go back and forth and we really, you know, we're not putting everything like the kitchen sink in these documents. We really are coming at this thinking about how we can be as less, as least invasive into your property as possible. It also has to have the use rights of the town. So since this, again, is a community system, um, your use of the system, if, um, if something goes wrong, it may impact or probably will impact the whole system. And so the town will have an obligation to maintain it. And so we need to outline in these easements what that, um, what that obligation will look like and when the town can come on and use that land. Um, it will also outline your uses. So if you had um, expected a particular type of use of your land into the future, um, that would be one thing that you and I should be talking about sooner rather than later so that I can look at your parcel, look at your um, easement and begin to try to craft some language that, that comes and meets you, hopefully, um, where you're at. But we do have to have that language so that everyone is clear what's permitted and what isn't. Um, and then, of course, the typical, we agree, and this is the language to convey this easement to the town. So that's the general thrust of the types of things that are going to be in these easements. So right now, what is happening is uh, um, Hoyle Tanner is finishing up their engineering design. And my role kicks into higher gear once the engineers have said the design is nearly complete or fully complete. Because it doesn't really make a lot of sense to start describing how the system is going to look as it comes across your property um, if it's still changing. So this is another just reminder, a good time to go to those office hours and discuss any concerns and challenges you have with the current design with the engineers because the sooner they sort of flush out all of that, the easier it will be for this project to go forward. Um, but in the meantime, I and other lawyers in my firm are doing a legal review, which means we're going into the land records and we're looking at all the parcels that are involved in this project and we're going back 40 years and more in some cases and we're trying to identify any potential problems, any spring rights, any rights of way, any um, hidden storage tanks that any of you have in your, in your ground, which we haven't found any. Um, <laughs> But we first are looking for all of these, um, the documentation of anything like this that the engineers may need to know about um, and then begin to address in the planning. But then that legal review also is going to inform the basis of our legal agreement. The next step will be, in the next few months, we'll be moving into drafting those individual easements. 
So as the planning comes to completion, we start furiously drafting um, you know, about 100 easements. And then we'll go through the process of working with you to do the conveyance and the execution, and then we'll have to record it in the land records. So the request, I think, I, I know I have a view tonight, and um, I think our, my colleagues, the engineers, also have, is um, we would ask that if you have questions, and as you learn more about this project, and particularly how this project impacts your parcel, that you raise your concerns early. So, you know, I'm not here to be combative. I'm, I'm here to try to problem solve and to try to understand what your goal is and what you're trying to achieve. And on behalf of the town, I'm gonna to be finding solutions when they're there to work with you and solve them. But problems take a little bit of time. They take some thinking. They may take a lot of um, conferring with other lawyers who've done this in other towns um, that may have some similar issues. So I just ask that um, you raise your concerns you ask us directly, I'm gonna leave some cards and we'll have my, uh, my contact information at the end of the slide as well. And I guess with that, I just say, I look forward to working with all of you. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna move into question and answer. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to go through questions in the room first. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll pivot and we'll kind of unmute the speaker here and we'll go through questions on the Zoom. Um, so uh, I do ask that folks in the room uh, with questions, we do want to try to use a mic um, so that the camera can pick it up so that the recording can hear the questions. Um, and I do just want to note, just because I think some folks uh, might have joined the Zoom late and some folks might have come in the room late, but uh, right now, this was in the town report, but I want to reiterate it here for folks who might have missed it. Um, because of the failure to secure a disposal field for the system that's designed in the village, um, that project is, is on pause. And so, and if, like, the work we're talking about now with easements, constructions, all that kind of stuff, if we're talking about center specific, um, the village work is essentially on pause indefinitely. Um, so again, I just want to make that clear to folks that showed up maybe late or folks who joined the Zoom late. Um, so now we're going to move into question and answer. Again, if folks can, um, if what you can do is you can use the mic and if you can stand up when you speak just so that uh, the camera can catch you, that would be great. So, uh, questions? Yes? <laughs> make sure you stand up so that we'll be seeing. Speak right in the mic. Okay, I am. Hello. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when you're talking about the easements and stuff, for example, like if you have to come onto our property and um, dig up our driveway, which is paved, who's going to pay to fix that? Okay, so the question for those online was with the work associated with installation, if we come onto a property, and we say dig up a driveway that's paved, or say we dig up a lawn, or we have to go under a fence and have it temporarily removed, everything gets put back the way it was to begin with to the best of our ability. Again, in certain situations, it might take a while for grass to grow back. But everything gets put back the way it was, and that is on the dime of the project. Um, so we will, no, no, no. You won't have to repave it. So, the, the project is, is designed and intended to basically, once the construction is done, everything goes back the way it was, and then in an ideal world, in four or five years, once the grass grows and things come back even quicker than that, hopefully, you won't even know it's there. All right, other question? Yeah, Deanna, if you could run the mic, that would be great. Thank you so much. So if someone has their own water source, even though they're in the town water footprint, they still have their own water. Um, how will this affect septic usage? Because it's not 
you were going to build based on water into the home from water municipalities. And so how would someone's own water source affect the septic system? So the question was, how will existing water sources or water connections affect the system uh, construction design layout and use? So um, the actual construction design and use of the system will not impact the current use of the water system or not. So if you're, if you're on a spring or something like that, you can continue to use the spring. The, the system, the wastewater system will not change anybody's use of water or how they get water. Um, as far as the service area goes, the service area for the wastewater system was essentially wrapped around the current water system footprint. So the footprint of the wastewater system is essentially tagged to all of the properties that the water system currently serves. And the system is designed for build out within that area. Um, and so the capacity of the system is designed to allow for the calculations we did to look at essentially what would a 50 year full build out within this area look like. So for example, um, the property back here behind Main Street, right now it's vacant, but we looked at our zoning and said, what could go there? And so the system is designed so that if and when full build out happens on any of these parcels in that water area footprint, they can get connected and the capacity is there to accommodate that growth. Uh, sorry, we have a quick follow up, yeah? So I am in the footprint and I won't be forced to hook up to municipal water. So the system is designed to hook up everybody in the system area. Um, the way the system and the framework is designed is that if you're in the system area, we're going to hook you up to it. Okay, so if someone, is, I just want to, can you just give me a yes or no answer? Yes. Um, if I have my own water source, a spring, and you choose to, you find property to, um, for the, set, the village, I will be forced, yes or no, to hook up to town water. If, under the framework we're using, if the village system were to be constructed, the same framework would be, would be used, and yes, we would be hooking your property up to the wastewater system. She's asking about She's asking water, not water. wastewater. Oh, no, sorry, no. You would still be able to continue to use your spring. There, yeah, yeah, so there, there's no impact on the use of the water system or not use of the water system. The only connection to the project as far as water goes is the footprint of the service area was mirroring, mirroring the footprint of the water system. Area. Okay, and part three, sorry. Um, the way you were looking at billing at, from the, the past meeting a year or so ago was that you were going to measure the water coming in from the municipality into our homes and you base our bills on water coming in. So how would you build someone who's not connected to town water because there's no water coming in? Yeah, so the, the question was how, how, the question was that the design of the system was to use the amount of water in to kind of calculate the amount of water out, and that would be kind of the, the rate of use of the system. The question is, if you are not connected to the system, how would we uh, measure your usage? Right. Yes. Take that, John. So I'm going to hand it over to John. I, I do recall this question from 18 months ago. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, at this time, we don't have an answer. The simple answer is we don't know, but we would work it out. Um, it, it would have to be some fair way of billing you uh, or whomever has this type of situation. Perhaps it's based on average water consumption amongst the other users. Hold up, hold it up. Uh, or there, there would have to be a, a fair way to work it out between this, you know, th this user and the town. Um, I I'm not aware of many uh, uh, s users that this would apply to. So it, it's, it's not a widespread matter that would need to be addressed, but uh, it would just need to be worked out. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, next question. Yep. Go ahead. Please stand up. Yep. Thank you. I, my question is, is 
what, what's going to happen to the existing uh, septic tanks that you have? Are they going to be taken out? Yeah, so the question is, uh, what happens to the existing septic tanks? Are they going to be taken out? I'm going to hand it back to John to answer that one. So the existing septic tanks will be removed and replaced with new septic tanks. In the same location? The, the plan is for the same location. If there's a problem with that, then we'll, we'll have to work that out as well. If, you know, I, we're aware of septic tanks that are underneath decks, or I think one's underneath the swimming pool. Uh, so that, those types of matters would need to be worked through. Does that answer your question? And I just want to clarify too, John, I, I think the way we're working it is that the plan is to pull the tanks and replace them with, with new ones, but if there is a tank in place that we determine can be used because it's a newer system or it's in good shape, we will use the existing tank. Um, and so, again, we're going to look to do this as efficiently as possible, and so one of the things that we are doing is going through and looking at all the wastewater records we can find to determine what systems look like, what condition they're in, so that we can kind of get a heads up in terms of what does this tank look like, can we reuse it, and we will do that if we, if we can. But what we do want to do is if we've got a tank that's been in there since 1960 and is you know, not in great condition, we don't want to reuse that tank. We want to put a new tank in. Again, all of this is baked into the cost of the, the project. Individual landowners aren't going to be charged for a new tank. Um, so it, it's part of it. Yes, Parma. My question is more of a curiosity. With the water system, we have a commercial rate and a residential rate. Is that going to happen with the wastewater fees? Um, so Parma's question was, with the water system, we currently have a residential rate and a commercial rate. Are we going to have that same framework with the wastewater system? Um, the short answer is we haven't written the ordinance yet to, to, to kind of govern that. and so. I don't have an answer for you. That is certainly something that we are going to consider when we when we do that. Um, I think the main thing here is we want to make sure the framework we set up is equitable. Yes, please. If you have the mic, take the floor. Okay. Uh, on top about your basin, your water uses on water in, water out. What if you have a place that's grandfathered in and has a dry well? So the question was, what happens if you have a grandfather dry well? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Do you understand? No. Would we have a dry well that's grandfathered in and they're illegal or whatever thing where our washer goes? So we're not going to have water going out in the sewer. Uh, like, a, like a gray, like a gray one. Okay, so uh, the question has to do with an existing gray water system. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. it's called a dry well. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'd invite you to come to the office hours and, and we can discuss that further, but I would anticipate that uh, a gray water system, if that's, if that's what it is, that, that should be connected to, to the wastewater system. So we'd have to change all the plumbing in the house? Well, that's, uh, we'd have to take a look at that. Yeah. Um, when are those meetings? Yeah. <laughs> Coming up in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, very. Uh, the financial calculations that we saw, uh, one of the elements was the use tax. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to be the same every year. And it's never going to hit that exact number. As, that, as the income from that fluctuates, how does that affect the bill? I'm sorry, we're getting some feedback for those in the room. I apologize. Um, so the figure there is, is a conservative figure based on what we've actually raised. Um, looking at the year receipts, we are looking at more like closer to 90000 So the 80000 is, is what we thought would be a conservative um, number to plug in here. Um, and then as far as growth or sustained uh, receipts to the local option tax, our hope would be that barring some economic really bad downturn in the community that causes businesses to leave and people to flee, 
we, we wouldn't see a massive depression and dip in that. Um, but since that is supporting the debt service, that is tied to that. Well, will it vary every year then? Um, the receipts from the local option tax will vary every year in terms of what we get in. Um, but the figure we're using is what we're trying to look at as a conservative estimate to plug into the budget calculations. Okay. So as it goes up or as it goes down, will that affect the individual's bill? So the question is, as local option tax receipts go up or down, will it affect the individual's bill? Um, the answer is, uh, well, one, we just set up the ordinance that governs this, so that's not in place yet, so this isn't firm, but it, it will. The other element here about individual bills is that as the system grows and more connections occur, what we call ERUs, more users will join the system, and the more users that join the system, the actual cost per user goes down. And so with growth on the system, the actual cost per individual user will, will tick down. I see two hands, I don't know who was first. Uh, yeah, whoever, whoever wants to be first can be first. Hey, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in the village, so I'm not in the system. Um, so this is still proceeding under the vote, the proceeding with caution vote, that one? So, there, there's been, so the question was, this is proceeding under the initial bond authorization vote. So, yeah, the bond authorization vote allowed things to move forward, and then there's been subsequent votes around financing for things. So each, each one of those votes has been kind of a, another step authorization to make the project work. The, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember the vote, and I remember the war and said, this doesn't mean it's, it's not a green light, it's a proceed with caution, it's a yellow light. Um, and every every project is going to have its snags. Um, I, I guess people are just do different things in yellow lights. Um, and it seems like, it, to me, with this many, like, if I'm in a yellow light, there's like a semi coming and there's a lot of problems, I, I don't go. But, um, that's something I guess that I would, I would, I'm hearing that maybe a new vote would be appropriate. And the only other thing I want to know about is, is I do agree that this would open the door for a total new kind of development in Montgomery. And is there any easements or like ordinances? Of, you know, there's a lot of towns at the base of Ski Mountains that have, you know, McDonald's and some stuff that maybe we as a town might, might hurt some of Montgomery to have. And if there's been any work to protect ourselves and to help this thing, help the, the sewer can help us grow in a good direction instead of into a potentially <coughs> direction that maybe people wouldn't like. Okay, so um, Jimbo's question had to do with, with the development of a system like this that is accommodating growth and development in the community, um, what is the check for control over what kind of development is that going to look like? Um, the example was, will the McDonald's show up on Main Street? Um, so this system is designed agnostically. It doesn't understand or care what kind of growth it sees. It's designed to allow for growth. What controls what kind of growth we see in a community is our town plan and our zoning ordinance. And so the town plan is being rewritten right now um, there was a hearing Monday uh, to discuss the last round of edits. The select board is going to approve that plan either this coming Monday or at a, soon, at, a, at a date soon. That plan sets a vision for the community. It says, what do we want our villages to look like? What do we want our hamlets to look like? What do we want our downtowns to look like? The zoning ordinance then comes in and says, here's how we're going to do it. Here's what we're going to allow. Here's what we're not going to allow. Here's what conditional use is going to look like. So what I would encourage everybody to do is as we work through the town plan and more specifically the zoning ordinances, get involved and make sure you look at it because that's what's gonna drive what growth looks like. So again, the system is designed to allow for and accommodate growth, but it's agnostic as to what that growth actually looks like. Someone wants to build Trump Tower on Main Street, the system can't, doesn't do anything with that. It's the ordinances that affects that, so. We only accept that Trump won't want to build here, I think. I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that was a bad example, but. No, it's the change stores that you can't get funding. Like, 
like if they won't open up a franchise on a sector because it's challenging. And the, what I think what makes this town great is it's a hard place to live. And as we make it an easy place to live, it attracts a different crowd. Yeah. And so yeah. like, but like what you're saying, like the McDonald's or any of those other places, in order for one of them to come here, we have to have the population to support it. We definitely don't have that population, so they're never going to come. Okay, so I do want to. I do want to make sure that we kind of have a conversation flow for the folks who are joining online where it's already kind of a struggle in here. Um, so we're going to keep going through questions in the room and then we're going to hop online. So, Dan, go ahead. Just going back to the uh, each person on the unit, the users. Talk into the mic, I can't hear you. All right, thanks. Um, so if you, uh, if the local option tax that comes in, uh, if it increases by say like 50, 60, 70% and gets up to that $140,000, does that mean every single user would have no out-of-pocket expense on an annual basis? That's a great question, Dan. So the uh, local option tax is designed to uh, go toward, it's not designed, it's specifically enabled just to go towards debt service on the system. Um, a goal of this whole project is to attain affordability. If folks remember one of the slides John looked at, um, we had a target of MHI, mean household income. We're coming in right now at about 1% of MHI as far as what the user fees are. There's no other system in Vermont that has user fees pegged at an MHI percentage that low. So to Dan's question though, if all of a sudden we see this massive growth in um, the sales tax receipts and the local options tax is generating a million bucks a year, what happens to the user rates? And I think the question was, is there a floor at which the users pay nothing? So when we design the ordinance, that will be a part of the question because the other alternative here is that we use the local option tax receipts to pay off the note much more quicker and get rid of the local option tax. So when we design this, we're gonna have to figure out, is there essentially a floor we go to? Like, do we expect folks to pitch in, users to pay 200 bucks a year or something like that? Um, so I guess to answer your question is, when we, when we design the governance of it, we'll have to take that into account, but the main thing here is that the local option tax receipts go towards debt service on the system, and the main goal here is basically making it equitable and affordable as best we can to the users on the system. Just to follow up on that then, uh, a rate of 1.1% is half of inflation, like generously speaking. So I think like paying that off sooner might not seem to make sense if, if there is a way to just get it all the way down, nobody pays anything on an annual basis, and then that note can stay for the 30 years. So like a 1% note, we can't get that at the bank right now, right? Yeah, so Dan was just commenting for those on the line about the interest rate being 1.1%, which is a, a rate that no one's gonna find right now at a, at a bank for either a commercial or a reasonable loan. Uh, other questions in the room before we pop over? Yes, exactly. Uh, hopefully just one more separate thing. Question. Uh, I mean, so if you decide that you're going to utilize an existing tank uh, and then say three years down the road it fails, is the owner on the hook for that or is that going to come back to the Yes, yeah, so the question was, say we decide we're going to use an existing septic tank and then three years down the line that tank fails. So. All of the infrastructure that is associated with this project is going to be town-owned, which means that if something goes wrong with it, the town fixes it and it's on the dime of the system. So there's no cost to a landowner to come in and fix something or, or do something associated with that. Uh, we're going to go to, let's go to Barry and then Sue. Am I correct that the figures we saw before applied only to the capital cost, and that there would also be a separate uh, cost based on usage. So the figures we saw before include operation and maintenance fees and things, so that's all baked into it. So it's capital costs plus the annual loan. Okay. Joseph, I can't stand up. That's fine, don't worry. Um, my question is about the little white flags that are all around. What, what are those flags representing? I got like 15 on my property. Yeah, so uh, Sue asked about little white flags in the states. I'm going to give it to John. <laughs> That's where the gold is buried. <laughs> yeah, so those, those stakes are uh, locations where we're going to do uh, borings. So we're going to bore down up to 15 feet and see if we hit ledge. Because uh, we're going to be, the, the project includes construction of roughly 
20 some odd thousand linear feet of, of buried plate from 6 to 14 feet deep. And we want to provide information to the general construction contractor about what they might encounter when they're, when they're trenching in all that pipe. And, and uh, we want to know uh, each, at each of those locations whether, whether we hit ledge, how deep it is. And so that's, that's what that's for. We've, we've got about 100 borings to, to be put in uh, around the center. Oh, I want to say one thing before you go online. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got uh, one more question in the room. Uh, where the mic? Oh, right here. In the front. <laughs> I was just curious on that initial $384 figure, whatever it was. So that's the estimated cost to, to the users. Is that on? Is there a monthly fee associated with that that's based on water usage as well? Um, no, so that's the annual cost to all users on the system. Um, anything, so the question was whether the fee, whether the uh, figure we were looking at, if I have this right, had anything to do with water usage or, or monthly? Yeah, work? just like if you have a four bedroom home versus a two bedroom home, that's, I, you made comment on use, deeming the, or determining the, the sewer fee, monthly sewer fee, based on usage of water, and that depends on how yeah. that that's a $350 annual user fee. Was It's an estimate for as if uh, those costs were spread out evenly across every user. But as you point out, a two bedroom home is going to use less water than a four bedroom home. And uh, the actual user rate will be based on water consumption. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the $350 number was, was to give a sense for what the user cost would be, but it could be lower for a low water consuming uh, user, or it could be higher, quite a bit higher, for perhaps a business or a restaurant uh, where, there's, where there's a lot more water consumption than, than a typical family home. Perfect, thank you. I have a question, Charlie. Yeah, Deanna, go ahead. Um, so the water um, project was based on several different bonds. And those who did not connect to the water system at the time that it was implemented and came on in future years had to pay a certain number of quarter bonds. So I'm wondering about the property on the back of Main Street, since it's not developed yet and doesn't have its infrastructure in place. If that is put in place five or ten years down the road or sooner, will the cost for that be in the form of a bond for all of the users, or would it be at that property owner's expense at that time? How would that work? So Dan's question had to do with comparison to how the bond payments are uh, structured on the water system and where if you join the water system, you essentially have to pay back bond payments to connect to it. Um, so the way this is designed, there's, there's no bond payments associated with it, so there would be no back bond payment. Um, initial connections to the system are going to be at, at no cost to a landowner, um, and so everybody gets hooked up, it's part of the project. Future connections, we, we again, we haven't designed the ordinance, but future connections, there might be a connection fee in terms of what it costs to hook up to the system, but there's not going to be like a back bond payment such as there would be with the water system. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to, oh yeah, do you want one? Yep, right here. I'm sorry, and then we'll go to Chris. Let's go to, I'm sorry to hear you. So the question was, if we look at the total estimated cost of the project right now, what happens if that cost escalates or goes over? Um, so we, so I mean, I, that, that cost will fluctuate some. Um, if it goes up exponentially, then the final financing will look different. But what I can say is that we have busted our ass to get as much public money toward this project as we possibly can. It's from percentage of funding, it's more public money than any other project in the state has essentially ever gotten. And we're also working with our partners at the state right now to address cost overrides and increases and draw down more public money in the form of ARPA grants and other things. 
And so the state is committed to looking at the affordability metrics that we've, we've pegged here, and there's a, there's a mark at which if it goes over that affordability metric, it, it can't, essentially. I mean, the way this is designed, we're, we're committed to that affordability metric. And so those figures could fluctuate some if the cost does go up, but we're gonna compensate for it on the back end by going out and essentially getting more money. Also, if you have go into this next state of the bond, which I'm positive is going to, then is that interest rate going to stay the same for 30 years? So the question was, will the interest rate stay the same for 30 years? Yes, um, that interest rate of 1.13% is locked in with the federal government through the USDA Rural Development Loan. So that is a fixed interest rate for the project. And let's go to Christian and Bella. That was my question. Okay. Yes, we're going to uh, let Sarah chime in and we'll go to this one. Charlie's mentioned the ordinance a few times, and I, the gentleman who made the remark about the yellow light kind of piqued my interest. So the ordinance is something that's very important and requires town process. So one of the things I'm doing tonight and I'm listening for is, for example, your comment about what are the other ways that would be a fair way to write into an ordinance for you to be charged. And, you know, someone asked about, is there a floor, like sort of a minimum amount? And I also now have this, the state is, I mean, Charlie has his conversations with folks who are financing. I've also been in touch with the, the state and everybody is rallying around the support for this community. And so they, they've offered, when the legal team comes to them and says, can you help us crack this nut? Can you go out into other projects, other places, and give us some ideas? They're willing to come to us if you can help us you know, generate these questions. They're not yellow lights to me, they're great opportunities. And then my job is to work with Charlie and say, here's a bunch of options, and then you work with your local officials, you have hearings, you, you talk to the people who it's impacted. So um, I, I, don't, I just don't want anyone here to think it's discouraging that, that this ordinance hasn't been written because I think it's better to know what you're writing it for than to just take any written ordinance that another town has and try to apply it to this project because you, you are different. So you will have that opportunity. I just wanted to chime in from the legal perspective. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, so at this point, we're going to go to questions on the Zoom. Um, so I'm going to uh, unmute the speaker and maybe back up some so we don't get feedback. Um, but Kip, I see you have your hand up. So Kip, if you want to come off mute and ask your question, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I think the last uh, select board meeting I said, you know, if you're going to have stone environmental, uh, look at you know, some possible smaller sites and some disposal areas, potential disposal areas. The idea is that you might be able to use multiple smaller sites instead of one larger site. Is that uh, continuing? And do you have any update on that? Uh, thank you, Kip. So, Kip's question. Um, um, so Kip's question for those in the room was that uh, regarding the village project, um, it is on pause uh, indefinitely at this point. There is an alternative that we are investigating just to see if it would be something feasible to look at. Um, there's a lot of unknowns in terms of what that would look like, but right now, What's happening is we're asking the um, uh, stone environmental, which is the hydrogeologist that we work with, to do a desktop look at the soil maps for that area, just to see if there would be any kind of feasibility in looking at a different system that's more of a clustered design. So when we think about this being a community system where it's designed kind of like we talked about, a cluster design system is where essentially rather than one disposal field, there's multiple fields. The desktop review we're looking at right now is to look at, is that a feasible alternative to look at in the future? There's like 90 other questions that come after that that we'd have to tackle. Um, so we're essentially now, Kip, we're still looking at it. At this point, it's looking at it in terms of, is there a viable alternative to pursue in the future? 
Um, given the way things are progressing right now, a lot of magical things would have to come together to actually have a village project progress that way on a similar time frame. My anticipation would be that if we identify that as a potential alternative, it would be something we'd have to investigate further and we'd be on a much longer time frame. So um, that's, that's essentially the status of what that looks like right now. Okay, so on the, on the Zoom, uh, is there another question from anybody? Uh, yes, we have a hand up from Merle, it looks like. So, Merle, if you want to come off mute and ask your question, go ahead. So Merle's question was that uh, essentially the way we're talking about the village system is that it's postponed indefinitely. He asked, does that mean there is a future, a future point where we might try to put a system in the village? The future is a long way and I can't say no. So what I would say, Merle, is, you know, yeah, there's a chance that in the future, if the stars aligned and the funding aligned and everything worked, the town could go forward and put in a system in the village. Um, what we're doing now, again, is to see, like, is that even feasible, given what we're looking at with clustered systems? Could it work in the future? Um, but when we talk about indefinitely, we don't know what that time frame looks like. So the short answer is yes, in the future, the town could pursue this if everything lined up appropriately. But on the current timeline we're looking at, as far as the funding stack we're looking at and the timeline to use these funds, it, it's not going to line up in the current uh, the current timeline and work scope that we're doing at now. So it's, it's not anything that's going to happen anytime soon. Okay, uh, yeah. other questions on the Zoom? The other uh, thing is some people say they have never got the answer to, and that's the system initially, I guess, before the town. So I, I think Merle, I, uh, so Merle had given a series of votes, some of which passed, some of which didn't. Um, and I, I think Merle was framing it as, given that a couple of the votes did not pass, I think Merle was framing it as the will of the people was not to move forward with it. I guess I would uh, disagree with your characterization of, of how that happened. Um, the votes that failed had to do with a couple different ways of financing the system. Um, there never was a question that said, you know, yes, no, up, down, left, right. Um, and so what the select board did is they put forward options to advance it to find one that was viable and the voters could pass. We found one that was viable and the voters passed it and the work moved forward. Yeah, so Merle's question was, what is the purpose of removing the systems, the septic systems that are there? Couldn't they be left in place to reduce the cost of the project? So Merle, the answer is yes. Um, when we go to each system that exists right now, we will look at the condition of the current septic tank, and if the tank is in good condition, we will reuse it. Um, and so to the greatest extent possible to minimize costs and increase efficiencies, tanks that are in good condition will be reused. Now, leach fields that they're connected to, they will be disconnected. Um, there's, no, there's no use of this system for the leach fields, so there's, there's no adaptive reuse of that portion of existing systems. Thank you. Thank you, Merle. Other questions on the Zoom? Okay, Larry, yep, go ahead. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. So Larry asked about the surveys that went out and the questions that were asked on there. Um, the questions on there had to do with concerns people had, and there was a question on there, I forget the phrasing of it, but essentially said, you know, I forget the phrasing, but if, if there was an alternative to not hook up, would, would you not want to hook up to the system? Um, and to be clear, that was not an offer of an opt-out, it was more to get the read of the people in the service area to see kind of what those numbers look like. As Larry pointed out, we did get a certain percentage, I don't remember exactly, but it was somewhere you know, under 30% or around 25 to 30% that had checked that box. The problem was that, if our memory serves, most of the folks that checked that box didn't put their name on the survey, which is what we were asking for to identify where people were and what that would look like. And so essentially what we were looking at was where were those landowners and how would that look at as far as layout of the system. And the other one had to, the other part of that was the critical mass of the system. Because to make this work, we have to have the number of users to make the system functional, both logistically and financially. Um, so the short answer to the back part of your question there is that no, no, there is no opt-out. Uh, the question Larry had was the purchase of the property on 242 to support the disposal site for the center. We do not own that property yet, but we will in the next 48 hours. Uh, Larry's question was what about the permitting process if that fails? So we've essentially done everything we can with the state and federal partners to get all of the answers we can about permitting for that site that we can before um, we owned it. To actually submit the permit, we need to own the site. So there is a potential, you know, potential uh, course of action here where we go and we apply for the permit and for some reason they don't give us the indirect discharge permit. In that case, we would own a property that has pretty great development value and we would sell it. So the next question was, um, as part of the permitting process, and this is where I don't know specifically, but as part of the permitting process, if it was challenged, would the town defend that? And the short answer is yes, we would, we would defend the, the challenge for the permit. Great, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Larry. Uh, any other questions from the Zoom? Feel free to just come off mute and video and start waving frantically. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions on the Zoom. Again, I apologize for those on the Zoom for the technical issues we had tonight. We will post a recording of this meeting online as soon as possible so folks can view it who were here and want to see it or who could not attend. Um, if there's no other questions in the room, we'll wrap things up. Well, I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, have a great evening.